My name's Paula Giron. I'm a technical leader at Cisco Systems. And I'm here to talk to you about a project that I'm running there, um, which is the Asami Graph Database. So today, I'm going to give you some of the background of this project, um, but I'll also give a short introduction to what graph databases are and how to do graph modeling in them. I'll get into what's needed in graph databases for storage and querying. And I'll explain how Asami goes about doing that. And then I'll finish up with a brief example of how we use it. So who am I to be telling you about these things? I've been working on and off with graph databases now for 20 years. I was in a small team who designed and implemented one of the first commercial graph databases. It was called the Tucana Knowledge Store, or TUX. This was an RDF database, um, which is a graph standard from the W3C. Uh, now, TUX disappeared into commercial history, but not before some of it was open sourced to create the Mulgara project, which I maintained for many years. I contributed to the Sparkle standard, which is a standard query language and API for talking to graph databases. And I served on the committee for the second version of the standard. I also have a long history of building rule systems for RDF and OWL. Now, my first rule system was built into Mulgara. But then I moved into a commercial project, and that worked on any RDF database through the Sparkle interface. Now, that worked so well that it occurred to me I could apply this to any graph database if I had an API adapter. And so I started doing that as an open source hobby. Um, but then shortly after I started at Cisco, I showed my boss at the time, and he was very enthusiastic about applying it to our work. So he gave me the go-ahead to continue doing open source um, uh, work on the company time. So for our own use, we needed to select a graph database from the options available. The main requirements were that it should be built in Clojure, because all our systems were being written in Clojure. And that eliminated a number of the better known systems. It also had to be open source, and that eliminated Datomic. And this leaves us here with DataScript, but at the time we hadn't heard about that. So my manager said to me, just build your own. You can do that, right? And I was a bit nervous about saying yes, because I knew from experience just how big a project like that could be. Um, the man who owned the company when we wrote to Kana and Mulgara admitted that he would never have sunk so much money into it if he'd had any idea just how big building a graph database would become. But in this case, I knew I didn't need much. I could do all of the storage in memory, which meant that I didn't need a lot of the complexity for storing on disk. Uh, or in the cloud. And the rule system itself would only need a handful of features. It needed pattern matching. It needed join and filter operations. And then it needed to be able to filter, to project the results out. But then after I got it all out, I was asked to port it to ClojureScript so that we could run it in the browser because we started shifting systems out of the back end and into the front end. So it was running in both ends now. And then I was asked to add aggregates like counting or max. And then I found that many of my colleagues weren't using it because they weren't familiar with the graph API and um, uh, this was very unfamiliar for them. So I wrapped it in a more familiar API, the Datomic style uh, API. And that led not only to them using it more, but the open source community started picking up on it then as well. Now, this continued until I realized that I'd actually re-implemented most of what Mulgara had. And that was a bit of a surprise, because I thought a full database would be too much for a single person. Mulgara written in Java is about 100,000 lines, uh, but Asami offering most of the same features written in Clojure is about 7,000 lines. So what is a graph database? 
Now, many people aren't familiar with them, so with apologies to people who do know what graph databases are, I'm going to give a short introduction here. Now, a lot of people hear the word graph, and they think of charts that they can build in Excel. Graph databases have nothing to do with this. Instead, they're based on graph theory from math. Now, this describes a series of points called nodes, which can be represented as dots in a picture. The location of the dots doesn't matter at all. And these nodes are then connected by a series of lines called edges. Now, in contrast to general graph theory, graph databases will usually provide a direction for these edges. Nodes are then usually labeled, as are the edges. This creates different kinds of edges, which, again, is not a usual part of graph theory. Now, nodes won't share a label, but edges usually will. So here we have edges. Some of them are called similar. So we have several things that are similar to other things. We have things which are related to other things. Um, so each individual edge definition is described with its starting node, the edge label, and the terminating node. And those definitions form statements and that provides an alternative representation for a graph. This is the same information that was being shown uh, in the image a moment ago. Uh, and as I said, the layout of the image doesn't matter to the math. Now, with a structure like this, we can model entities as the nodes in the graph. So these entities here represent um, people and roles in an organization. And we can show relationships here so this is a simple org chart of reporting relationships. Each node in this sort of system will usually represent an entity that can have various attributes and values. In this case, first and last names and a title. Now, these look like the sorts of objects that we see in JSON data or in Eden, which is the closure equivalent to JSON. Databases like Neo4j distinguish between attributes like this and edges which join the entities. But most graph databases treat those values as nodes, and the attributes just become more edges. Now, what's the point in all of this? Well, it's flexible. Unlike relational tables, entities can have any new attributes connected to them or new relationships with other entities. It also allows easy traversal from node to node. Now we can represent all of this graph with a series of equivalent statements. Now, for a database to be useful, we have to be able to get data back out of it. So let's look at a couple of queries. For instance, I can ask what the roles in my organization are. Here's a query for that. It asks, it has a pattern in the where clause, which is looking for something that has a title, and it calls that role. It then projects that role out with the find clause. It does this by finding all the statements, statements that match that pattern in the where clause, and then projects it out. The final result is that set of CEO, CTO, etc. Let's try another query. What's the name of the engineer's manager? So this query looks for an entity which, attaches, uh, which it attaches to the variable P with the title engineer. Now that entity reports to an, uh, another entity attached to the variable M. And the M entity will have a first name of name. Now that's the value we want. Finding the title matches a single statement with an entity represented by the keyword here, the capital E. We can then find all the reports to relationships. However, we've already established that the P variable at the beginning had been set to the keyword E. So we can rewrite that pattern, meaning that it now resolves to a single statement giving a single value for the M variable, 
And that's the keyword C. Now at each point here, we could have an entire set being bound to each variable, but uh, that becomes a, a graph that's too large to represent on the screen. Looking for the first names is similar to the reporting relationship. But again, we've already figured out that the M variable should be set to C, so we can reduce it down to, again, a single statement. And that gives us just one name, which is Carly. Carly is the engineer's manager. Now, how do we go about doing this? The database contains all of those statements on the left there, which you may notice is ordered first by the first column, then by the second column, and then by the third column. Now, what do we require from a table like that to answer our queries? Well, we may be able to find, um, we need to be able to find all the statements that match each of those patterns that we were looking at a moment ago in the query. So, here, here are those patterns as an example. If we look at the first one, we need to find all the statements that match the title of engineer. Now we can do that by iterating through the entire table, but that's not going to scale at all. So instead, we can rewrite the statements in a different order. This time, they're ordered by the second column, then the third, and finally, the first column. When they're ordered this way, the title statements can all be found quickly, and the engineer value is found in suborder as well in the third column. Looking for reports to statements is just as easy, but we'd already found the value for the P variable, which actually meant that we could find the required data in the first set of statements after all. The same thing happens with first names, and we can find, but because the M value can be replaced with C, again we can find it in that first table. By doing these substitutions, we're automatically getting a join between each of those patterns. Another alternative would be to, uh, to retrieve the entire sets and do a merge join, and occasionally that's going to make sense. Generally in Asami, though, we do these substitutions uh, where we do pattern rewriting. In each case here, the rewrite is for a single value, but you may be rewriting, say, a first name name and B first name name and C first name name and you iterate through those rewrites with the lookups. The lookups are very fast. We can find everything we want using tables ordered those two ways as well as this third table which is ordered by the third column, the first and finally its second column. And there are actually three other possible orderings but they're redundant and we don't need those. Now, to be consistent in the way we handle these tables, we'll reorder the columns so that the initial ordering is always by the first column. And um, we'll know which columns which by the definition of the table. Now, the first column is now full of a lot of repetitious data in all three of those tables. Uh, we can remove that, and in the first few instances where, the, sorry, in, in the few instances where we've got repetition in the second column, we can go and remove those as well. Now, for each single value in the first columns, we can wrap up the remaining data that, it, that it's associated with and connect it on. And we may notice in the far left table that those wrapped up values look like the entity value pairs of our original uh, data. And that provides a hint that these things are starting to look like maps. We can also wrap the data in the third column and attach it to the second column. Now this particular data set doesn't show um, the benefit that you typically get from it. 
Um, but if you look in the middle table here, reports to C, C has a pair of values of D and E. Um, a lot more typical data sets will have a greater, uh, a greater effect there. Now the way we can model this is with a series of nested maps. We can map an element to a map of an element to a set of elements, uh, representing that final column. Now, more recent versions of Asami, we've changed that final set. We've turned that into a map as well. Um, it maps that element to a set of attributes, which indicates both when a statement was created, and it provides a unique ID for a particular statement. This is all built using closures and mutable data structures when we're in memory. And we also take advantage of these structures not requiring particular data types for the elements, which is how we're able to um, reorder those maps. Using algebraic data types, doing exactly this in Scala, uh, got very difficult very quickly to do it all correctly, and I resorted to using any in the past. Uh, Closure isn't looking for that kind of uh, data information, and so uh, this was quite trivial. Now, we used to restrict some of the data types from being used in some places. Generally, things like strings and numbers should only appear as values. However, it turned out that by lifting that restriction, we got some interesting use cases. Uh, we're able to describe how numbers relate to each other, for instance. We can use strings as attributes, which doesn't make a lot of sense until you consider that JSON uses strings as attributes. But this is all in memory so far. How do we do this durably? In the cloud, on disk, that sort of thing. So to store them durably, we convert every element into a number. The tables then become rectangular arrays of numbers, and these are very easy to store. Initially three, but now four columns wide. Now, the arrays are limited to only 512 elements, and multiple arrays are then ordered by a tree structure that references them. Now, if a block is going to be modified, then it gets copied. And the original, the node referencing it is also copied along with every ancestor node to the root of the tree. And you can see that these nodes still reference their unchanged children back in the original tree. So we can make modifications without changing any existing committed data. Subsequent changes also do a copy on write with new tree nodes only copying ancestors that aren't already in the current transaction tree. Overflowing a block near the bottom there uh, causes it to split, and that's how new nodes get added to the tree. And by the end of the transaction, all of the original data is completely untouched. Large transactions may have a lot of new structure, but small transactions don't actually modify very much at all. Now, the statements that we're storing, those four numbers, are in the same ordering that we used for the maps, with a statement ID attached at the end. Now, that ID serves as a double duty as an offset into an array of statements. Uh, in the array format, that includes a transaction ID. Now, having th these IDs isn't necessary for most graph operations, but it does give us the opportunity to make queries about uh, statements which appear in a transaction, or to make um, statements about um, other statements where we can reference a statement by its ID. Now, statements made out of numbers like this are very easy to work with, but we need some way to go back and forth between the numbers and the values that they represent. Asami does this in two different ways. For some values, like short strings, the entire value can be encoded into a 64-bit long. We indicate this by setting the high order bit 
which makes it a negative number. And then using the remaining three bits of the high order nibble as a data type. If the data has a length, like string does, then the next nibble is used to describe that, and the remaining seven bytes contain the serialized data. For instance, this number on the right here represents the string hello. We support other data types this way as well, including keywords. And a number of data types based on numerical values that can fit into 60 bits. And this includes long values, dates, instants, booleans. It also takes into account the restricted range when encoding negative numbers. So you can see here how the negative two, sorry, how the two's complement form only extends up to the 60th bit. We do take full 64 bit length numbers, but they can't be encoded this way. Of course, a lot of data can't fit into eight bytes like this. So this data gets serialized into buffers. The offset of each item is the number that represents it. So these numbers can be used for an immediate lookup. Then if we have data and we want to find the number that the data is going to get mapped to, we have a tree index which holds the first 16 bytes of, uh, of the data in each node. And that allows most searches in the tree to be done entirely within the tree without having to look aside into the array. A principle I've tried to stick to throughout all of this has been to layer the implementation with each layer being described by closure protocols, which are similar to Java interfaces. The primary protocol is the graph. This is currently implemented three ways, with one being the durable block graph, which I was just describing now, and the other two in memory. Uh, one of the memory graphs supports duplicate edges. The block graph is built on tuple storage for statements and data storage for the number to data mapping. And the implementing objects are both based on the tree protocol. And that provides basic operations that are common to tree implementations. At the moment, I have AVL trees, but we're looking into other trees as well. And we can swap between them simply by sticking to the tree protocol. Now, both the trees and the higher level objects are built over blocks. And these are thin wrappers around NIO buffer blocks in the JVM. But the main work happens in the management of blocks, allocating, saving, and retrieving them. Uh, at the moment, the, the one that we use most of the time is memory mapped files, and the blocks are coming out of these files. Um, we use uh, patterns of allocation so that we can go well beyond the standard two gigabyte uh, range of memory mapping. Um, but we're also able to use blocks like this for sending to databases, to sending up to the cloud, uh, any way we want to manage blocks. Now, we're still updating this API to, uh, to also support uh, an async API. Um, so we don't have, we're not able to do a lot of this work in, um, in ClojureScript at the moment because we need everything to be async all the way down, um, which it isn't just yet. But most of this code is still reusable between Clojure and ClojureScript. And in fact, when we start swapping out one, uh, one of these objects for another, so long as we stick to the protocols, we've been able to uh, swap between various implementations without incident. So creating one of these graphs in code can be done with a create object on a URI. And the URI describes, um, first of all, that it's a SAMI, but then the next part of the scheme describes what type of um, storage you want to have. But we can also simply call connect directly on the URI, and that will do a creation as well as connecting to it in a single step. We can then transact data into that connection. Now, there are a few different formats. We can put individual triples or uh, lots of different things. But the most commonly 
used way is simply an array of entity objects. Um, the dbident in these two objects here uh, is useful for referencing those entities later on for reading or updating them. So in this case, there's just two objects. The first one is Elizabeth, age 20, and the second is Jane, age 22. Now, we can do an update by transacting data to that same ident. However, because Asami is based on an open world assumption, unlike many other graph databases, that would create a whole new age. Liz would be age 20 and age 21. If you want to do an update, we have to inform the database that that's what we're doing. And there's a couple of different uh, approaches for doing that. The one that I've used here is, has a quote at the end of the age keyword. Uh, that's an annotation which says that we want to do an update instead. Uh, and that can be very useful when you're updating a specific known attribute. But I keep talking about transacting things. What's going on when I transact something? Why, when I showed the structures earlier, were the old trees being left unmodified? Well, whether it's in memory or stored in blocks, the database is all stored with tree indexes. And these trees have roots, which provide access to all of the data underneath them. Now, these roots can be saved along with a timestamp to describe the contents of the database at the end of their transaction. A new transaction will update each tree, creating new roots. And those new roots will get stored along with their timestamp to save the database at the end of that transaction, and so on. This gives us an array of database values, which we can search through to find what the data look like at any point in time. So if we go back to the code to see this in action, we can capture the database before doing a transaction. We get the database from the people connection, and that's original. We can then do an update to Liz's age on the people connection, and then we'll get the database after that transaction. If we ask the same query from both the original and the new data, we'll see that each returns its appropriate value. So we're getting both the current and the historical data at the same time. They're both available at once. But we don't have to hold on to snapshots manually like that. Instead, we can use the timestamps to find the appropriate data. Now, if I calculate the time from yesterday, I can use that time with the current database to ask what, what the database looked like 24 hours ago querying both of them like last time gives the same two different answers. Now, there are other ways that we can go through the history as well. We've got transaction IDs, which are stored in order of one, two, three, four. Um, we, we can say that we want to see the, t um, the data since a particular time or as, a partic as of a particular time. These, some of these are also available in Datomic, and I believe it, it's uh, implemented in a similar way but it's very fast to find the transaction that you want, and all of the data at that point is, is easily, readily available. Now, it's technically feasible to allow transactions on historical data, but if I did that, I'd have Git-style branches, and that would create a management problem that I don't want to go near. Um, I would need to figure out how I want to safely merge data, things like this. So at the moment, um, historical data is left read-only. But if you do want to work on it, you could uh, copy the data from there and import it into a new graph. You can create a new graph by connecting to it. In this case, I'm going to put it into memory. And then I can export from there and import it into the new connection. Now, this technique does not preserve the history, but you already had that. However, that could be a bonus if you needed to remove the history for legal reasons. I could, uh, there's various 
places where legislation requires that data be uh, dropped off. So I can pick an appropriate point of time, import it into a new database, and then delete the, the previous database. Now the title for this talk promised that I'd show how to load data in two lines. This is it. You create a connection to a graph, and then you transact your data into it. Now, a small difference here from some of the earlier examples is that the code being loaded now is pure JSON as it appears in the file. That means that all the attributes are strings, which is a strange concept for most graph databases, but I explained this earlier. Um, it allows us to convert our data into a graph with minimal modification. Also note that unlike many closed world systems, um, we can just import data that we haven't seen before. We don't need a schema. It just goes straight in. So once data's been loaded like this, you can issue queries against it immediately. Now, in this case, this is a real world case that someone approached me with. They had a large packet capture file that was um, full of deeply nested objects that had spaces in some of the keys. So this query is asking for all the statements where the, so all statements, I didn't care about the entity or value, just the attribute, the A in the middle. I'm looking where the attribute is a string and it ma matches a space regular expression. Now the data that came out of the file look like this. Obviously, there are lots of different ways to find this kind of thing. You don't need to put it all into a graph database to, to do it. But it turns out that this sort of thing is easy and flexible. And simply by having JSON inserted into the graph database this way, it became very easy to navigate through data that we hadn't seen before. OK. So, while we'll usually use Asami uh, either in web pages or as a library in a, uh, in a larger project, uh, we've also built it as a command line tool using GraalVM. Now this lets us load data quickly and executes queries from the REPL uh, or directly on the command line. So let's see if I can navigate this well. <laughs> Let's have a look at the packet capture file, the sorts of things that we were getting back. And what was happening was that uh, uh, the person with this file wanted to find keys which had spaces in them. And looking at that, it, it was causing him all sorts of problems. So to run that, we have the Asami program. And we're going to load data into, I'll put it in memory. Data. And the file to load up. And I'll execute this query. Oops. Patterns, if I don't care about the third element, I can skip it. I want to find where A is a string. And I want to find where my regular expression And this is a command line syntax for regular expressions. As uh, when applied to A, should be there. Close quote. And I hope I've typed this correctly. And so that's loaded up the entire JSON file, indexed it, turned it into triples, and then run the query ag engine against it to get this sort of data. This ad hoc approach doesn't really scale 
exceptionally well because you know, the larger the data that you're working with, the, the deeper the indexes get, the um, indexing is a slow operation. So this was a cut down version at 500K. The original file was seven megabytes. Um, so the packets here is at 583K. If I, the original file was seven meg, I can run the, this against the original file. Now this takes maybe six or seven seconds on, on this notebook to index all of that and run it, but we get all of the data back out now. Now, uh, for instance, I can check to see how this was working in the original. Yeah by using something like JQ to just reformat the file. And I'll grep it, giving it a little bit of context. And let's look for that particular key. And it shows up twice. Uh, each time it's inside queries as a key for as DNS lookups. So that data's in there, but to process this sort of thing through JQ, looking for keys which have strings in them, you can do it. It gets very awkward and tricky. Having everything thrown into a, uh, into a graph can make this sort of data very easy to search for. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to uh, search down, find anything which contains uh, keys like this or values like this, what's, what encapsulates that, what does it contain, how does it relate to other things, all of this starts falling out very naturally when you put, import it into a graph and it gives a, a really useful way to explore JSON. Okay, if I return to my slides now. Other stuff. There are lots of the features in Asami that I haven't looked at here today. The query planner does a lot of work to ensure that joins are ordered to minimize work, and it keeps getting more complex with every new feature that gets added. Subgraph identification, fast transitive closures go heavily into graph theory, and they would take a talk all on their own. And also the transitive relationships, transitive closures, and optional constraints. These are things which I've borrowed from Sparkle. Uh, we also have efficient subquerying and optimized aggregation operations. Uh, a lot of these things distinguish Asami from other graph databases, but they all have their pros and cons as well. The project is under active use at Cisco, and it's made its way into the SecureX security products. There's still a lot I'd love to do, and I've made some progress on a few of them already. More recently, some people have even started helping. Of course, I want every part of it to be faster, and new features for users are very important. But the backend storage still has a lot of scope for expansion. In particular, I want to duplicate a lot of that query engine to have an asynchronous API so that ClojureScript version can talk to a graph that's built with blocks that are stored in local DB or in an external database. Uh, I'm also looking at different tree types for the data pool. Uh, the AVL trees work really well for the, the, the block storage, the, the tuple storage. Um, fortunately, that decision to abstract all of the layers, as, as I have, has made this really quite feasible without uh, needing to modify anything else. And um, that's everything. <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions? So if, so you're looking to do lots of steps. When it, if you're looking at something like a transitive closure, that does a, a space versus time operation whereby it doesn't try to step across, it tries to find all of the grandparent relationships, for instance, or the parent relationships. And it joins this data against itself 
uh, creating a... Um, uh, every step, it doubles the distance that it's found. And so it, it, it becomes a log. So if you've got, say, 256 steps, uh, it's, it's performed that in eight steps to find those. So transitive closures are very fast. Um, there is some memory usage in doing that. Um, but it, so far we haven't had any issues with making, with, with scalability problems of do, doing anything like that. Uh, you can fall back to doing linear work, but then, you know, at one point someone was doing something which was linear and it took 90 seconds in memory. Um, switching over to using the transitive closures it took, um, was that 80 milliseconds? So Asami hasn't gone into heavy scalability um, at this point. The, um, if I wanted to really scale, I'd probably move to Neptune to do that. Um, the main issue with it is not the querying, it's the indexing. Um, it can take a while to index blocks using the things that we have at the moment. Um, so like on your local hard drive with memory mapped files, if you want to index um, say two to three gigabytes, that can take over a minute. Um, but that's actually reasonable for a lot of local databases. Um, however, once it's in, we're still getting sub-second query responses. So it's really aimed at, at fast, uh, fast queries and if your updates are small, making them fast as well. But when you're trying to load large amounts of data, then it's, that's a bulk operation that takes time, and that's our major concern at the moment so with, with scalability. Aside from time, yeah. Uh, almost all of the operations, uh, with a couple of the graph analytics as an exception, almost all operations are lazy, and so it's only accessing what you've. Um, uh, what, if you issue a large complex query, it will only have retrieved blocks which are relevant to the part that you're looking at at the moment. And as you iterate through, then it'll retrieve more. Um, so we haven't had any issues with the laziness at all. You can, uh, you can work through it just fine. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.